Today's video is sponsored by Shortform. You don't have time to read every book ever written, and that's where Shortform comes in. You guys can get a free five-day trial to their time-saving book guides. More on them in just a bit. In the early hours of April the 25th, 1986, a botched safety test caused reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant to explode. The blast hurled radioactive debris far and wide, a fire ignited that burned for 10 days, releasing dangerous radionucleotides like plutonium-239 and cesium-137 into the atmosphere over northern Ukraine. It was, by any definition, the worst nuclear accident in history, one that made even the triple meltdown at Fukushima look like an explosion of ice cream and candy floss. But while the Chernobyl disaster remains ghoulishly fascinating, it's not the story we're telling today. Instead, we want to examine what came next. What happens after a nuclear meltdown poisoned an area larger than Greater London, rendering it uninhabitable for thousands of years? The answer is far more complex and far more interesting than anyone back in 1986 could have imagined. Established in the chaos following the incident, the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone is a Rhode Island-sized area of toxic land that's off-limits. Devoid of humanity, it's instead become a kind of ghostly Eden populated with animals that live among the abandoned buildings. Dangerous, beautiful, or inspiring this is the story of Ukraine's radioactive paradise. In the final book of the Christian Bible, the book known alternatively as Revelation or the Apocalypse, the prophet John records a nightmarish vision of the end times. Amid angels summoning mountains of fire and general nastiness, one image stands out above all others, the one contained in Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. For centuries, this passage were mere fantasy, one more apocalyptic vision from a religious text that is filled with them. It was only in 1986 that it gained striking prominence, quoted in awe by Ronald Reagan, and others. Wormwood, you see, is a type of wild-growing herb, one that can be found in abundance in the forests and marshlands on the plains surrounding the Pripyat River in northern Ukraine. Noted for its black branches, or Chornyi in Ukrainian, it would eventually give its name to the settlement that grew up there, Chernobyl. And it would be the number four reactor of Chernobyl, burning at temperatures to rival the stars, that would one day cause Ukraine's apocalypse. The recorded history of the area that would become the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone begins in 1193, when a small settlement was reported among the wild hunting lands used by the princes of Kievan Rus. Really, though, it can be said to begin long before humans intruded. A dense cluster of wild forests, bogs, and grassland that together made up what's been called Europe's largest swamp, the Chernobyl region's stood unchanged since time immemorial. This was Europe at its most primeval, the sort of impenetrable landscape where lost and hungry children might stumble across creepy gingerbread houses. Although people did try to live here, it was a tenuous existence. Floods would drown this wild world for months at a time. When it was dry, marauding armies would sweep through, dragging the few inhabitants back and forth between warring kingdoms. Perhaps it's no surprise that only outsiders and the oppressed seemed inclined to permanently settle here. At one point, the region was home to a thriving Hasidic Jewish community. But then the Soviets came, and suddenly the region was transformed. In the 19th century, many of the forests surrounding Chernobyl had been chopped down as part of a doomed drive to increase agricultural yields. Now the USSR's agents replanted them all, turning the wild land into a great pine nursery that could provide fuel and lumber to the Soviet Union. It's this altered landscape that we see today, not a remnant of Europe's ancient past, but a man-made imitation designed to maximize Ukraine's usefulness. It was in a similar spirit that the forest was chosen for another Soviet upgrade, the construction of the Vladimir Lenin nuclear power plant. Ironically, it would be this intrusion of modern technology that would ultimately turn the area around Chernobyl back into empty wilderness.
If you're looking for a textbook definition of irony, you can't do much better than what happened at Chernobyl in the spring of 1986. Shortly after midnight on April 25th, an ill-designed safety test on an even iller-designed RBMK reactor resulted in a very unsafe spike in temperature. The runaway reaction saw the inside of the reactor reach nearly 4,650 degrees Celsius, far hotter than molten lava, and not much cooler than the surface of the sun. Seconds later, the building housing the reactor exploded. Over 28 tons of radioactive material was vomited out, scattering over the landscape, all of it lethal to touch. This was just the beginning of the nightmare. As panic gripped the plant's workers, a gigantic fire began in the core, a fire which burned for 10 days, carrying radioactive particles up into the atmosphere, where the winds wafted them first over northern Ukraine and then over most of Europe. Overall, some 400 times more radiation was released than by the bomb that hit Hiroshima. Dangerous levels of fallout were detected as far away as Sweden. As we said in the opening, though, we're not going to dive too deep into the Chernobyl disaster itself. If you want the details, you can actually check out our video over on our sister channel, Biographics, which gives you all sorts of terrifying background info on that. For today's story, all you need to know is that it wasn't very long before even the Soviets realized that they couldn't keep this covered up forever. After a couple of days of lying and obfuscating, Skating, they abruptly evacuated the nearby city of Pripyat, giving its 50,000 plus residents barely an hour's warning before whisking them away. That done, the authorities turned their attention to the surrounding farms and villages. With the reactor still burning, with deadly gases still being ejected into the air, a 30 kilometer circle was drawn around the disaster site. Every human inside that circle would be evacuated, every domestic animal would be shot. It was the beginning of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. As nasty substances like iodine-131 rained down, more than 116,000 people were bussed out. Over the coming months, that number would expand by another 234,000 as the shape and extent of the zone metastasized like some sort of toxic tumor losing its circular borders and growing into something far messier. By the end of 1986, the area deemed uninhabitable had expanded to 4,700 square kilometers, 2,600 square kilometers in northern Ukraine, and another 2,100 in southern Belarus. Altogether, an area larger than Yosemite Park was denuded of human life, barring the essential workers still struggling to contain the fallout. It's this extraordinary boundary that still today defines the limits of the modern CEZ. Today, the frantic activity that marks the desperate time is long gone. Instead, the shuttered area is returning to the wilderness it once was in the days of the heathen Rus, a collection of dense forests and evil-smelling bogs that see very few humans. Yet if your mental image of the zone is a desolate, irradiated wasteland only good for Instagram and ruin porn, and think again. Far from being a post-apocalyptic hellscape, the CEZ is surprisingly, and amazingly, alive. Now, before we continue with today's video, I do want to give a shout out to today's fantastic video sponsor, Shortform. Look, if you like my channels, then you probably like to learn about stuff. A lot of you, I bet, like to expose yourselves to new ideas or new information by reading, which is great, but the last two decades have seen an exponential rise in the content that's available for you to consume. From YouTube content like mine, to articles, podcasts, and of course, traditional books. Now, if you're like me, you probably feel like there's never enough time in the day to consume everything that you think is interesting. Well, that's where short form comes in. They hijack the central themes and need-to-know ideas from hundreds of books, making them available to you in easily consumable packages. And this could be a really convenient tool. For instance, you might know there's a massive 500-page tome that you've been thinking about reading, but you're not sure if it's something you want to invest pretty much all of your free time in. Pop into short form, check out the summary, and you'll have a much better idea of whether or not it's worth your time. Short form is also a great tool for books you've already read, listened to, their guides once a book is complete and it can give you additional insight on some of the major motifs or maybe you've read something a long time ago and you want a bit of a refresher if you're a subscriber to some of my many channels there's probably several genres on short form that you'll like for example there are sections on biographies world war ii the cold war and true crime all topics that i talk about quite a bit to be honest and there's also geography where you can check out the guide for an absolutely mind-blowing book called prisoners of geography 10 maps that explain everything about the world i don't want to spoil anything it's an absolute must read so go check it out on short form you guys can get free unlimited access to short form for five days plus a discounted annual subscription at shortform.com forward slash geographic so definitely go take advantage of those five days and get yourself some short form and now back to today's video
When Chernobyl erupted like a giant bottle of radioactive soda, it spewed out some unbelievably nasty stuff. Cesium-137 joins plutonium-239 and other scary-sounding things that are inimical to life. So much so that the International Atomic Energy Agency estimates most insects and rodents living in the worst affected areas died off. Nowhere in the newly established exclusion zone symbolizes this more than the Red Forest. A four-kilometer square patch of pines, the forest had the bad luck to be downwind of reactor number four, receiving the brunt of the fallout. The entire forest turned a bright orange red as the trees died en masse. Although they were chopped down and bulldozed over by cleanup crews, the image of such unnatural destruction became a handy symbol of the disaster. A disaster that's still ongoing. Of the various radionucleotides released in the meltdown, some had a half-life of several days, meaning the time until they decayed away to become safe, while others had half-lives of several years. In Plutonium-239's case, that half-life was 24,000 years. Perhaps no surprise, people thought nothing would ever grow here again. But they were wrong. Since 1986, plant life has aggressively returned to the CEZ. The area of the zone covered by forests has gone from about 30% on the day of the accident to over 70%. There are mushrooms, berries, mosses, a whole world just full of life. In fact, nature has been so quick to take over the abandoned villages that many, including the Ukrainian government, now consider the exclusion zone Europe's largest wildlife sanctuary. You can catch a glimpse of this just by looking at the ways that different countries refer to it. While Ukrainians call it the CEZ, the Zone of Alienation, the Belarusian side is known as the Palsy State Radiological Reserve. Not, not just to the radiation, but also the wild animals living there. All of which may have left you wondering what happened. How could a place so badly poisoned continue to thrive? And the answer lies in the fickle nature of fallout. If your knowledge of radiation is limited to half-forgotten action movies, you might expect a meltdown like Chernobyl to equally affect all nearby areas. But the reality is that those nasty particles we mentioned settled unevenly. Carried by the wind, radioactive fallout spreads itself out, barely touching some places while creating extremely dangerous hotspots in others. This means there are parts of the CEZ relatively near the reactor that were barely affected, while several kilometers away there could be a patch of land that would be dangerous as hell to linger on. Since the wind was blowing towards Belarus, the Ukrainian side actually has fewer hotspots, meaning that most of the zone is mostly safe most of the time. As the companies that run tours to the abandoned villages are fond of saying, the radiation dose received visiting Chernobyl is lower than you'd get on a transatlantic flight. Of course, that's not to say the authorities could reopen the zone. While background radiation levels are today over a thousand times lower than after the explosion, these hotspots still exist. And they occasionally move. Dangerous particles are shifted around by wind and by rain, while many more have seeped into the ecosystem, poisoning water sources and wild growing food. Were humans to come flooding back in, the cancer rates a few decades later would be stratospheric. Still, the fact that most of the zone is relatively safe has been ideal for its non-human inhabitants. So it's time for us to meet the wildlife that calls this inhospitable place home. <laughs> In 1998, fans of Przewalski's horse were in deep manure. Likely the last remaining subspecies of wild horse, their favorite animal had long gone extinct out in the wild and were now on the verge of staggering into oblivion. Desperate to try and reverse its decline, experts hit on the idea of releasing a handful into protected nature reserves in an effort to get them breeding again. The headline act was Mongolia's Kustain Nuru National Park, where the horse had once roamed wild. But as backup, it was decided that a few other places should be tried. So it was that between 1998 and 2004, 36 were rehomed in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. As hilariously bad ideas go, this should have been up there with new coke or investing in Aussie media. Sort of like, hey, how about we introduce this extremely endangered horse to one of the most toxic places on earth, yes? But that just goes to show how little I apparently know about horses and radiation. By 2014, the Chernobyl population of the horse had grown to 65. Come 2024, it's thought there will be over 150 living wilds. What's incredible? Is this isn't an isolated story. Even as the normally plains-dwelling horses are adapting to the forests, finding shelter in abandoned barns, other animals in Chernobyl are staging their own comeback. The most famous of these are the wolves. Long ago driven to the margins in most of Europe, wolves have started creeping back into the zone since 1986. It's thought that at least 60 now call the area home, with some estimates 
putting the number significantly higher, although since wolves roam over large distances, it's hard to say for sure. What does seem true is that there are more wolves in the zone than in other protected landscapes. One study found that the CEZ has seven times more wolves than other reserves in Belarus. In terms of wolf population density, Chernobyl is now thought to rank ahead of Yellowstone. Nor are they the only once rare animals reappearing. Brown bears, moose, European bison, lynx, wild boar, polecats, deer, and mink are all on the increase in the heart of a continent where big, wild animals are mostly fading away. Take beavers, for example. With each passing year, the number of beavers living in the CZ appears to be increasing. As a result, more trees are being felled. This, in turn, means boggy areas are growing, meaning the landscape is increasingly starting to look like it did before humans arrived. Maybe you've heard of rewilding, the in vogue idea of returning tracts of land to nature. Well, Chernobyl has already achieved this. In the 35 years since the disaster, this unassuming slice of northern Ukraine has become a thriving, self sustaining ecosystem. System. Not that there aren't major controversies surrounding it. The debate over the effects of radiation on Chernobyl wildlife is surprisingly heated. While no one's denying that the animal population has spiked, what it means is still up for grabs. On the one hand, you have guys like Jim Beasley who agree that sure, maybe radiation is still hurting individual animals, but on a species wide level, they're thriving better in the aftermath of a nuclear accident than they would be in a regular landscape that was home to humans. On the other hand, you have dudes like Timothy A. Masso who says he's documented signs of genetic mutations or deformities in a huge percentage of Chernobyl's animals. In this view, the hotspots are still causing damage, a view backed up by a 2020 study that found way fewer animals living in these hot zones than elsewhere. So, sadly, it's not quite as clear as saying humans are worse for the environment than a nuclear meltdown, delightful as that soundbite might be. Yet yeah, there's one member of the animal kingdom we haven't covered yet, one that's actively chosen to return to the exclusion zone despite the ever-present danger. We're talking, of course, about Homo sapiens. In terms of offers, do you want to live in a radioactive exclusion zone? Well, most people would probably rank that up there with do you fancy a porcupine enema? But the Samoselli aren't most of us. Ukrainian for self-settlers, their name refers to the people who were evacuated in 1986, only to return years later to restart their lives in Chernobyl's radioactive shadow. To date, almost 1,200 evacuees are thought to have come back, sparsely repopulating the villages that their ancestors called home. Some came for ideological reasons, refusing to leave their home soil. Others because, since radiation is invisible, they didn't believe they had anything to fear. Most, though, simply found life as evacuees too miserable to handle. From subsistence farmers, the Chernobyl zone has transformed them into city dwellers, crammed into hastily constructed apartment blocks and forced to fit in. Many were shunned by their neighbors who were scared of catching radiation sickness. Add to that the confusion of city life and the trauma of relocation, and, well, maybe it's not so surprising they wanted to go back. These days, very few Samoselli remain, almost all of them women. The Ukrainian government has forced most younger people to leave the zone. Only those old enough for the cancer risk not to matter were allowed to stay. As a result, most of the returnees have died off. The 2021 estimate put their current population as no more than 130. Some live in little clusters in otherwise abandoned villages. Others are now the only ones left in the area, marking their time in this forbidden zone until death comes for them. When that happens, the last living link between the decaying villages and the outside world will be broken, and already it's badly strained. None of the Samoselli have access to running water or shops. Most grow their own food or pick it from the forest, where fruits and mushrooms have absorbed dangerous amounts of cesium-137. Winters, too, are harsh. Semi-alone in the wilderness, the self-settlers burn trees to ward off the biting cold. Since Chernobyl trees are affected by radiation, each fire sends yet more radionucleotides back into the atmosphere from where they fall to Earth in many reenactments of the 1986 meltdown. Yet for the Samoseli, this danger doesn't really matter. The brutal fact is that old age will kill them before radiation-induced cancers possibly can. But they're not the only ones in the zone. Stalkers are both the CEZ's biggest nuisance and its greatest publicist. Taking their name from the Andrei Tarakovsky film Stalker about a dangerous forbidden zone and 
The men who infiltrate it, they are mostly young thrill seekers who break in under darkness to explore the ruins. You know those haunting Chernobyl photos that appear on your Instagram? The stalkers were the guys who started that trend. Unlike the daytime tourists taking similar photos, though, stalkers actually live those images. They sleep in abandoned houses. They climb onto the rooftops of decaying apartment blocks to watch the sun come up on a dead post-human world. Unfortunately, they also do insane stuff like drinking unfiltered water and eating potentially contaminated food. Insane because one of the contaminants is strontium-90, which the body absorbs like calcium, creating a future risk of bone cancer. Not an issue for the elderly Samoselli, but an acute one for young 20-something stalkers. Still, the stalkers occupy the more benign end of the CZ's illegal activity. There are reports of secret logging taking place at night, and thieves are known to break in to steal abandoned scrap metal. There's even a long-standing rumor that Ukrainian mafia bosses bury bodies in the Red Forest since the ground is so highly contaminated that trying to dig them back up would guarantee future ill health. But we don't want to dwell too long on these clandestine groups. Instead, we want to finish this chapter talking about its last residence, the refugees. Just as Chernobyl in the distant past was a place for outsiders, so too has it become a home for the displaced now. In particular, recent years have seen those fleeing the war in Donbass settle on the fringes of the CZ, where houses can go for as little as a few hundred dollars. Although technically just outside the zone, the soil here can still be contaminated, but that's a step up from life on the front lines. As one Donbass refugee memorably put it to the BBC, radiation may kill us slowly, but it doesn't shoot or bomb us. It's better to live with radiation than with war. By now you might be thinking, so what's the big deal with this exclusion zone? It can't be that dangerous with all those people and animals about. And you wouldn't be alone. Once a niche proposition, tours to the CZ have exploded in recent years, if you're pardon the terrible pun, with nearly 125,000 visitors in 2019. Yet even now, these tours only account for 5% of the zone's daily foot traffic. There are 7,000 people working in and around the decommissioned nuclear plant, spending shifts of 15 days in the zone, then 15 outside. These are the conservationists studying the forests, the people who clear the trees, those running the infrastructure, like the daily train. Then there's the guards, which have been monitoring the zone's borders so long that they've started to befriend its feral dogs, descendants of those that escaped the Soviet order to kill Pripyat's pets in case they carried contamination. With so many people coming and going, it's easy to get lulled into a false sense of security, to start feeling like Chernobyl today is just some big fancy theme park, another item to tick off the bucket list. But while visiting Chernobyl is broadly safe, the idea that it's another regular place is an illusion. The danger in the CZ is very real, and recently one natural phenomenon has begun to really worry scientists and that's wildfires. Back in 1986, all that contamination that got blasted out of the burning reactor eventually fell to Earth, and some 90% of it settled in the canopies of Chernobyl's pines. When those pine needles died and fell to the forest floor, the radionucleotides fell with them, contaminating the topsoil. Since many of them mimic non-harmful elements, the trees of the forest eventually sucked them back up, this time absorbing them into their bodies. For Ukraine in general, this has been great. The trees act as a kind of holding tank, keeping the radioactive elements within the zone. Take the trees out of the equation, and the decades of shifting winds and flooding rivers would have carried these particles far and wide. The bad side? When those same trees burn, they release all those radionucleotides. Following a 1992 wildfire that ignited over 12,000 acres of trees, scientist Vasily Yashenko decided to find out just how dangerous this could be. In a controlled experiment, he burned a section of Chernobyl pines for 90 minutes to monitor what came out. The answer? A whole ton of plutonium, cesium, and strontium. Before an hour had passed, Yashenko had received more than three times the maximum allowed yearly dose for Chernobyl workers. And unfortunately, wildfires in the CZ are happening with more and more regularity. In 2015, a 37,000-acre fire sent radiation levels skyrocketing. Even worse was a series of 2020 wildfires. All told, 165,000 acres of trees burned. Flames nearly engulfed the ruins of Pripyat. At one point, the wall of fire got within 4.5 kilometers of the ruined reactor itself. The result was radiation levels 16 times higher than normal. The smoke was so thick that it blew all the way to Kiev, each lungful potentially dangerous. As far away as Norway, cesium levels increased in the atmosphere. And this was just the biggest fire to date. It's been estimated that were a California-style wildfire to hit Chernobyl, burning up the entire exclusion zone, everything in a 150-kilometer radius could be contaminated, including Kiev. 
While you wouldn't see people dying in the street, that's still three million people who could see their cancer risks skyrocket, all thanks to a simple wildfire. With climate change, the likelihood of such an apocalypse only grows every year, and don't forget, some of the radionucleotides in Chernobyl will remain dangerous for millennia. These days, it's easy to forget the reality of the CZ, to only focus on the images we see online, and not the history. But make no mistake, this remains a place with teeth, not just a wild memorial to the worst nuclear disaster in history, but an ongoing ecological concern that will potentially impact our descendants for generations. The artificial star that was Wormwood's burning reactor may not have caused the apocalypse, but it did leave behind traces that will shape this corner of Europe for better and for worse for tens of thousands of years to come. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And thank you for watching.